All right, if you will, turn to Genesis 17 this morning. So we're finishing up our study on the names of God this morning. Genesis chapter number 17, we discover one of the, uh, to me anyways, I, one of the more well-known names of God, and that is El Shaddai. Uh, you may remember back in the 80s, Amy Grant had a version of the song El Shaddai, uh, in which she talked about, or the, the lyrics of that song, I guess, talked about the, the many aspects of God's character as well as many of his names. And uh, so this morning we're looking at El Shaddai, and that's a, you know, it's really a powerful compound connection of El, which is God, and Shaddai, which means almighty or sufficient, as we'll see this morning. And together as El Shaddai, we find that name seven times in the Old Testament, uh, but then there's also 41 times that God is referenced to as Shaddai. And so uh, we see here uh, the name is introduced uh, in Genesis 17 when Abraham is still referred to as Abram. And it's very hard for some reason for me to say Abram without saying the ham at the end of it. So if I say Abraham, no, I'm talking about Abram. It's the same person. Uh, just give my little disclosure there beforehand. Uh, even in typing, it's hard to stop at M. My fingers just want to go on and put an H-A-M at the end of it. So anyways, so uh, Abraham receives a visit from the Lord. And this is where we learn the name El Shaddai. Uh, so let's pick up our reading in verse number one this morning. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless and I will make your, excuse me, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you're, you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So there it was in first number one, uh, if you picked up on that, he says to him, I am almighty God. And so that's the name El Shaddai. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you this morning and we just, uh, God, pray that you would just help us to understand the meaning of this name and God, how that applies to us as who you are. And God, may we uh, just learn from this, God, that, that it's in these times of, of, of trouble, God, times that we go through in our lives that we uh, all these names of God that we've been learning, we realize that you have a name, uh, it seems like, for every situation, God, and that we can call on you, and what that teaches us, us is us, God, that we can call on you in our times of need, and so, Lord, we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I do pray, amen. So, God introduces himself to Abraham as El Shaddai in the context of a covenant. And so we see that God is, El Shaddai is, a God of covenants. And so this covenant is a formal agreement that God is, makes with us. He made it with Abram, and there's other covenants we see throughout the Bible. And so all of us have, who have trusted in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, uh, we have entered into what is called the New Covenant. And if you remember, Hale uh, read these verses uh, last Sunday night. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so through this new covenant that's unveiled by Jesus Christ, we have entered into an agreement with God. And it's a binding covenant, okay? It's, it's binding that God will be with us and we with him. And so it's between God and those who have trusted in Christ for their salvation. And so the fact that El Shaddai is introduced to us in the context of God's covenant is nothing small, right? Because God takes his covenants seriously. 
And it's very important to keep that in mind as we explore this name this morning, uh, that God is a God of covenants. All right, so we originally saw God's covenant with Abraham 25 years earlier in Genesis uh, chapter number 15. I'm going to flip back there. You can as well if you want. I'm going to read the first four verses of Genesis 15. It says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And so we see here that God gave uh, Abram this agreement when he was 75 years old, and that was when God told Abram, that he had a special plan for him and a special blessing. And so, in fact, God's covenant uh, always involves blessing. And, and so a blessing is God's favor that is expressed to you or I uh, through... Let me, let me start over. I think I read the wrong text just a second ago, and that's in my mind, and i got to get it out. I think I was supposed to be in chapter 12, but that's okay. Let's keep going. All right, so God's covenant always involves blessings. So a blessing is God's favor that's expressed to you and through you to others. And then here's the key of it, okay, to bring him the glory. So often we say, well, God has blessed me and, and, and because of some material thing that we have or, or something of that nature. But in reality, a blessing, a true blessing from God, is God's favor expressed to us or through us to bring him the glory. That's what a blessing is, right? It brings God the glory. So it's ne never only what God does to or for us. It has to go full circle to truly be a blessing. So in other words... A blessing is what God does to you so that it might flow through you and give him glory. So we are blessed in the way that we're used by God, right? It, it goes full circle. So when God told Abram he was going to bless him, it, it wasn't just a problem to a promise, excuse me, to bring about good to Abraham. Instead, he said he would bring about good to Abram and then make him a great nations, so that, it's in chapter 12, let's flip there, because that's where I was supposed to read a while ago. Chapter 12 and verse, let's read those four, because we were supposed to. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse them who curses you, and then here it is right here, what I was getting at. Uh, he said he would bring about good to Abraham and make him a great nation so that in you all the families of earth shall be blessed. And so we see that blessing goes through and it gives God the glory. And now fast forward a few years to chapter 15 where I was uh, at there for a second. And we see that Abram has begun to doubt the promise will ever come to be. So he asked God in chapter 15, he says, I don't have a son yet. Did you mean that you're going to bless me through someone born in my house, uh, Eliezer? In other words, Abraham assumes that since God hasn't given him a son, that the heir that God intended to use to fulfill this promise of making him a great nation would be someone born in his house instead. And so Abram reasoned, how could the promise happen if God hasn't given him a child yet. And so Abram does what many of us do today. We, we get logical on God, right? We try to figure out how we can help the process along or, or what we can do to speed it along even. Uh, and so he tries to reason his way into the promise. But what we got to realize is God is bigger than our logic and he's bigger than our reasoning. He's not bound to our rules. John and I were having a conversation one day this week, Thursday, how we try to put God in a box. God, you've got to do this because that's who you... We, we can't put God with rules. 
right? Because he is bigger than our rules. He's bigger than our logic. He's bigger than our reasoning. And so as Abraham tried to logic with God, God responds to Abraham that the heir would indeed come from his own body. It wouldn't be from somebody who had simply been born into his home. Uh, but, you know, oftentimes we do this ourselves. We, th this new information that, that Abraham has now received, he begins to think of another solution, right? With the help of Sarah, his wife, they say, well, you know, the, the heir's got to come from Abraham, and obviously he and Sarah can't conceive, so that must mean that Abram was to have a child with someone else, and unfortunately he does. Uh, chapter 16 goes on to tell us the story of Hagar. Uh, Abram and, and Sarah take matters into their own hands, and Sarah comes up with this plan for Abram to, to sleep with her maidservant Hagar in and, and, and hopes of obtaining the promise. And in their minds, God was moving too slowly, so they were going to help the process out, right? They were going to, to do things themselves, and if we're familiar with the rest of the story, we know how devastating a decision that turned out to be, not only for the people of that time, but also for the nations that have followed. So we know that, that uh, the son was born Ishmael, who became the father of the Arabs, and, and through the Arabs and the Israelites, they have been in conflict ever since. And so God introduced his name El Shaddai to Abraham 25 years after the promise was first given in chapter number 12. Both Abram and Sarah had become old. They had tried their own method in an attempt to help. Nothing good come out of it. So now they sat waiting without an heir, and most likely assuming that God had abandoned his promise. Now, I would dare to say that we could probably all relate to that at some point in our lives, right? We, can, we, we, we have that feeling that God has taken too long to meet our needs or to fulfill his promise or, 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 or whatever the case may be. We, we feel like God's just kind of delaying on it or God's not doing it fast enough or even God has abandoned us all together. And, and we try to do things our own way. We try to figure it out. We try to logic and reason with God. And, and a lot of times our decisions that we make end up delaying the process even more. And so, but it's precisely in those times that God reminds us just who he is. And so it was at Abram's moment of, of doubt that God told him that his name was El Shaddai. And so what does the name El Shaddai mean? And I, I love this. I think it's very interesting. El Shaddai is a God who supplies our needs. Okay? El is the shortened name for Elohim. You should remember that. That was the first name that we talked about. Uh, it means the all-powerful creator God. But what is amazing to me about this name is the name Shaddai. Okay? It comes from the word, root word Shad, which literally means breast. Okay, so Isaiah draws on this word picture in chapter 60 and then also in chapter 66. Uh, and let me read verse 10 and 11 of chapter 66. And it kind of paints the picture of what, what we're seeing here. Uh, Isaiah says, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her, from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious abundance. And so the word shad or breast as it's used there uh, in English is used to signify the supply of nourishment. So when a woman nurses her baby, she supplies what that baby needs to live. And the name El Shaddai, when coupled with its root meaning, presents this image of God supplying the nutrition and the nourishment, excuse me, needed to sustain our lives. And so Elohim, the God creator, and then you put Shaddai together with it as the God sustainer. And so he is the God who creates and keeps his people. And so what was Abraham and Sarah's problem? They couldn't produce life. She was barren, so they had no children. So how could God's promise, which was entirely dependent on Sarah's having a baby, could be fulfilled when she had no capacity for new life. Well, Ab Abram and Sarah knew that they couldn't fulfill the covenant on their own. They couldn't do what God said he was going to do. 
And I would ask you this morning, have you ever felt your own ability to produce what you believe God has promised in your life? Do you ever wonder how even God could work with you or through you when you have so little to offer? I know I have. God asked me to do something. I said, God, I can't do that. That's, that's too big. That's too much. That's too, too out of my comfort zone. It's exactly during those times that God reminds us that he is the creator God who can create something out of nothing and sustain life all on his own. Right? He is El Shaddai. He'll work it out. We don't have to figure it out because God's got it. Just as he did with Abram and Sarah. He doesn't need our unrighteous help just as he didn't need theirs when they involved Hagar. And so their motivation was probably good, right? They, they were thinking, okay, Abraham's got to have a son. Let's give him a son. But they went outside of God's plan to try to fulfill what God had promised. And in doing so, they actually got in the way of the fulfillment. They hindered and delayed the progress of the promise. Now, God would do what he said simply because he is faithful. Right? God is faithful. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his covenant. God has the power to bring into the visible and physical world that which exists in the invisible. Right? He doesn't need raw materials to work. Remember, he created the heavens and the earth with nothing. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. That's what that word means. He certainly didn't need Abram's and Sarah's help to give him a child. After all, his name is El Shaddai, both creator and sustainer of life. And he loves to manifest himself in the context of the impossible. So thirdly, this morning, El Shaddai is a God who we can dwell with. <coughs> we, he, we can dwell with. Uh, Psalm 91 this morning is another verse that the name El Shaddai is found in. Uh, verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, he will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Two names of God there in that, that one verse. Hale mentioned the name El Elyon last week. It means the Most High God. So when Abram went and defeated the kings who had taken Lot, he met in the valley of the kings uh, with the king of Sodom. And there was another priest and king there by the name of Melchizedek. And here Melchizedek refers to God as the most high God, or El El Yon, which shows us that God is higher than all the rulers of the world. Right? God is above all. He is the most high God. He's higher than our problems that cause us to take our eyes off of him. And so what the psalmist is saying here in Psalm 91 is that it's all about where we dwell. He says, if we dwell where God dwells, in the shelter of the Most High, he'll be your El Shaddai. Right? So God wants your presence more than our programs. That really spoke to me about Kids Club. It's not about the program that we're doing. It's being in his presence with these kids and teaching them to be in the presence of God. So God wants our presence more than our programs. He wants our relationship more than religion. He wants our faith. Right after revealing his name, El Shaddai, God told Abram in chapter 17, walk with me. He says, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. So in the same way, God longs for us to dwell with him in his presence and to walk before him at all times. Jesus put it this way in John 15, 4. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abiding in the vine. What happens when you cut a branch off the vine? withers up and dies right so jesus is saying abide in me and i 
that just as a vine uh, gives through the branch the nutrition that needed to bear fruit, we abide in Christ, and, and as El Shaddai, we receive the nourishment so that we can bear fruit. And again, that blessing that gives God the glory back. So just as a baby can't demand to be fed in the crib when it's laying there all alone, but only receives nourishments that they need when abiding close to the mother, right? The same way we receive all we need from God, the, the manifestation of his promises, uh, the, the fulfillment of all that he has for us comes when we are close to him. When we follow him, when we trust him, we see that he is able and we discover that he truly is El Shaddai. God Almighty, our sustainer. I know at times it seems as if God has abandoned us or has forsaken us, and sometimes it seems like God is moving way too slow. Has anybody else felt that way, or is it just me? You're kind of like, come on, God, hurry up. We need to do this. But it's, it's the beautiful thing is that even though God told Abram at the age of 75 he would make him a great nation, and even though Abram stumbled along the way, as we know the story, and we can't fault Abraham, we do too, right? God still came back when Abram was 99 in what would seem like an impossible situation, right? He was 99, she was 90. And he says, I am El Shaddai. I've got this. That's what God is saying. I've got this. Are you ready to trust me this time? Let me close with an illustration. I went fishing with Mike the other day. I'm going to use Mike. Went fishing with Mike the other day, and I looked down the river, and he had caught this nice big rainbow, and he quickly, you know, took the hook out and set the fish free like you're supposed to, and I looked down a few minutes later, and he's caught a bigger one than the first one. Same thing, he takes the hook out and lets the fish go. And then a little while later, I looked down, and he's got this little bitty fish. And I'm watching him, and he puts it in his creel. And so we get back in the boat, and I say, Mike, why did you let the big fish go and keep the little one? He said, well, Laura's frying pan's only 10 inches. Okay, now don't throw rocks at Mike when we leave church. That is a made-up story. <laughs> Mike didn't keep the fish. But here's, here's the thing, okay? If all we're looking at is the size of what you see or what we can produce or what we have the capacity to bring about on our own, then we're going to be throwing back all the stuff that God wants to do in us and through us to bless others. We'll settle for the little things that we can do ourselves instead of experience the miracle of El Shaddai. So never look at the size of your pan because it will always be too small. Instead, look at the size of your God and remember his name. Right? So put your hope in El Shaddai. He knows us. He loves us. And he will sustain us when we trust him to fulfill his promises in us and through us. I've got one more story I want to share. I heard, uh, I was listening to Adrian Rogers one day this week going to town, and he told the story of this little boy out in the backyard and he was trying to move this big rock and the boy he was just straining and grunting and pushing and and giving all he had to try to move this rock out of his way and the dad goes out there and he says son what are you doing he said well I'm trying to move this rock and so he asked the boy he says are you using all the strength that you have and the little boy said well yes dad I'm pushing as hard as I can and the dad says no you're not using all your strength. You haven't asked me yet. And I thought, boy, that is good. We try things in life and we give it all we've got and all the strength that we've got. And we've got a father who is above all, who is the sustainer. He's the almighty. He's the most high. He's the creator. All of these names that we've looked at through this study. Why do we fail to call out to the one who can help us? 
Why don't we try to do it ourselves? So in closing this morning, I would invite us all to remember these names. They're there for a purpose. When God was inspiring the men who wrote the Bible, he could have just used the one name God all the way through the Bible. But no, he chose to use these different names that have different meanings to show us through all and in all, God is all. Heavenly Father, God, again, we come before you this morning, and I just thank you for this name that we've looked at today of El Shaddai. God, we know that you are the creator of life, and God, it's just so great to see that you as God Almighty are the sustainer of life as well, God, that you, you nourish us, God, you, you provide for us, and Lord, I'm just so thankful this morning that I have a God that I can call out to, that I know hears my cries, that I know listens to my cries, God. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us all to remember these names, God, as we go through the, the, the days, the weeks, years ahead, God. And when situations arise that seem bigger than us, God, or that we can't do on our own, uh, help us to remember, God, that we can't. But we've got a God who can. And God, may we call out to you as our Father to be the strength that we need, the help that we need, the encouragement, the healing, everything that you are, God, may we call out to you. It is in Jesus' name I do pray and ask all these things. Amen.